Oh, gosh, no, 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 no. Thank you, thank you. No, 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 good to be with you. Praise the Lord. You, you can be seated. Thank you so much, buddy. Appreciate it. You can be seated. Great to see you tonight. Thanks for taking the time to come hear the Word. How cool that other people might be doing other things, and you're in church on Sunday night. Hallelujah. There's something about that verse. Uh, as we see the day approaching, we gather all the more. So we're being righteous. We're being biblical. And it's amazing how he'll strengthen you. It just happens. You know, as a kid, uh, my friends in California, uh, uh, well, I was out there for a little while. I'm not from there. I'm from Louisiana. But they said I had a drug problem growing up. I did. My mother drugged me to church. And, uh, man, she was into it. We'd be in church every night. Like 1970 through about 75, I pretty much thought my mom had lost her mind. But... Uh, man, word, 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 to the point it's just excessive. But man, it gets in you. You have what you say. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in this world. There's something about making yourself as available. And it's submitting ourselves to his plan, and it just blesses you. Amen. I mean, I, th- I think about Mark eleven twenty three. 23. I heard Brother Hagin so much, bless his heart. I thought, is that all the man knows? Because we would go from, from Tulsa to Pennsylvania. We'd go to California to hear Brother Hagin. I didn't really want to hear the word, but I was thrilled to get out of school. I would do anything. Mom, Brother Hagin's going to be in Oregon. Let's go. Um, you know, but it'll get in you. And to the point, I was preaching the other day in Virginia, maybe last year. And the Lord said, you'll notice about Mark eleven twenty three. 23. That uh, Jesus said you could use your faith for figs, for desserts. Then you could use it for obstacles, mountains. Then you could use it for your desires. So two-thirds of your faith was for dessert and desires. One-third of your faith would move a mountain. You don't even need all your faith to remove a mountain. <laughs> Come on, man. There's just so much more there. How, we're so blessed, aren't we? Aren't we blessed? He's already presented you holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight. Oh, come on. If God be for you, who can be against you? He's so excessively, uh, uh, radically good. I was preaching in Corbin, Kentucky. Anybody know where Corbin is? It's the home of Kentucky Fried Chicken. And uh, uh, the pastor there is a dear friend of mine, and he was kind of going through a test. And I said, dude, uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken, I've preached all over the world, and there's a Kentucky Fried Chicken. So something can come from your town and go all over the world. Well, the first time I preached there, he just said this this last couple weeks ago. I was in his church. And uh, I had a word of knowledge that someone had Bell's palsy the first time I was there. He was just starting his church. There's only about 50 or 60 people there. So what are the odds on someone having Bell's palsy? I said, I I just had that word. I said, someone's got Bell's palsy. Nobody raised their hand or anything. Back then, I would call people down. or or I probably was doing end times, so I was going too fast. But anyway, so this lady's sitting there, and the lady beside her, the girl beside her said, I think he's talking about you because what came on you just got on me. Now, they weren't used to it. They were sweet Baptist ladies. This lady had Bell's palsy. She got healed, went home to her house at 1230 at night, called her Baptist pastor, and she said, I know Jesus doesn't heal, but I think I got healed tonight. <laughs> and the Baptist, sweet Baptist pastor said, don't tell anybody, but I believe he does too. Hallelujah. <laughs> so... So you, you just never know. God just wants to reach out. And in that church, or the next time I was there, I had about 10 or 15 words of knowledge. And I've done this a few times, maybe about 10, to where the Lord would give me a word of knowledge and they wouldn't come down. I'd go, well, that's that man right there. And the Lord would go point him out. In that church in Corbin, I had about 10 or 15 words of knowledge. And I'd say, there's a man here, you got uh, cancer and your prostate. Nobody come down. I go, all right, I'll show you who it is, this guy right back there. He goes, yep, just got diagnosed. Went out and found all these people, come to find out that every single one of them were visitors. So God loves to reach out to those folks that don't know what you and I know and just bless them. So he's just radically good. (laughs) I was in a service one time. I saw two elderly women, probably up in their late 80s, fist fight in the parking lot. And, uh, I, and so I called them out. I said, now, don't, don't raise your hands. But I said, I see these two uh, sweet elderly ladies. You're fist fighting in the parking lot. And they weren't going like this. They were swinging their arms like, I mean, rat, going crazy. And uh, so I went to the book table after the service. And these two sweet elderly ladies, probably 80, 85, they said, you know, it was us. We was fighting in the parking lot. I said, I recognize you. I saw you in the vision. <laughs> Isn't it just like the Lord, the Lord told them, go tell the other one you're sorry. So you're, God's so cool, he'll, he'll even fix it with your friends when you're fist fighting in the parking lot. <laughs> He's just good. So grab your Bibles. You just turn wherever you think you ought to turn. We'll see if you're flowing. Praise the Lord. <laughs> so 
Go to Luke 21, and we're going to pick up where we left off. We'll get into more about the coming of the Lord. So blessed are we that, that, that the Bible is full of more verses about this than anything. Why would God go to so much trouble so we could tell how close we are? So that you get more excited. You get more expectant. You get more uh, radical about your faith and having a finish line mentality. So let's pray. Lord, we love you tonight. Thank you for this wild bunch that came on Sunday night, Lord. That They mean business. They're hungry. So we, we lean into you, Jesus. Jesus, show us new facets of you. Uh, Holy Spirit, I ask you to unveil in a greater way, things that happened when Jesus was raised from the dead. May it be pressed in our soul and our spirit how wonderful it is that this conquering life lives and dwells on the inside of us. Father, help us. Help us have a throne mentality, that we're mobile thrones, that you've called each and every one of us in the last days to show that Jesus came out of the grave. Help us. Help us walk with you. Help us minister for you. Every person in this room, I ask you they'd all finish their course with joy. We thank you for that, Father, in Jesus' wonderful name. And everybody said amen. amen. Grab your Bibles. Let's go back to Luke 21 again, and we'll pick up with just a couple of minutes of signs, maybe a little bit of review about the signs that we got into this morning, and uh, uh, then we'll kick into the, the next event. So Luke 21, verse 24, and I know you remember every single one of the signs from this morning, so piece of cake, right? Amen? All right, here we go. Luke 21, verse 24. They'll fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive unto all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down or overthrown of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. So we see in 67, Israel got Jerusalem back. A miracle. Absolute miracle. The miracles, I talked about the, the tanks this morning, but there were so many more. There was one, one time where the Syrian army was coming down against some of the Israeli soldiers. And they looked at each other and said, man, it's three of us against this whole Syrian uh, regiment. What are we going to do? He said, how many bullets you got? The guy goes, I got three. How many you guys got? got two. They shook each other's hands, uh, basically congratulating themselves because they're going to end their life right there. Next thing you know, the Syrian army stopped and started screaming, Father Abraham, and turned and ran. Now, I'm, I'm quoting the guy they interviewed on Against All Odds on YouTube, the actual guy. He goes, it wasn't the, they looked up and saw Father Abraham, but it said it, these huge angels they saw too, and they said, we've never seen anything like the swords they had. When they, we knew there was nothing we could do to beat them. They took off running. So just divine intervention. you got a group of, of Syrian soldiers seeing angels with swords. And I like, when I was in Israel last year, uh, the, the, the Saudi Arabian newspaper came out and said, we still don't understand how Israel won the Six-Day War. And they attributed it to those men dressed in white on the front of the tanks. Remember the tanks I was talking about this morning? They saw men dressed in white in the front. They're called angels. So it's just cool that we have that realm getting involved in this realm. Why? The king's about to come back. Just as Gabriel came and made proclamation in, in the countryside to those shepherds, all these proclamations are made because there's a change coming. Jesus is coming back. So here, that's pretty cool that the Lord showed us a, a city's one back, and when you see that, time's up. So he gets in more detail in verse 29. He said, look at the fig tree, that's the nation of Israel, and all the trees. When they now shoot forth, you see and know of your own selves that summer or harvest is nigh at hand. He said, likewise, when you see these things come to pass, freak out and run to the woods. No, no, he said, when you see these things come to pass, no, talked about it this morning, no, that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. So Jesus said, if you see two events, uh, you're the generation, because the next verse is the one that's just absolutely radical. I'm glad we have it in red right here. In verse 32, he said, pretty clear, verily I say unto you, this generation will not pass away till all is fulfilled. Wow. And then he said something really cool, heaven and earth will be altered, but my words won't be altered. In other words, heaven and earth are going to be changed, but you can't change this, the group that sees these two. So this morning we got into many other signs. We got back to the Hebrew language restored, Ethiopian Jews brought back, fertility of the land of Israel, uh, the predatory birds, 172 different species of predatory birds. Got, uh, Ezekiel prophesied 2,700 years ago that fish would show up in the Dead Sea. When they show up? Last year. I mean, it's just crazy. You've got little things happening every week that are pointing to his return. We're blessed. Supernaturally blessed. We should be so excited that people should tell us to break that pill in half. <laughs> that they should be saying, you're on something. Because, I mean, the greatest change for our life is about to happen. We're about to see Jesus face to face. So we have all these signs. You have just radical signs. The fertility of the land of Israel. You have the Temple Mount Institute. You have all these things. You had foxes showing up on the Temple Mount. I mean, that's from Lamentations uh, uh, 518. All these specific things that God said you'd see just before the coming of the Lord. 
Hebrew language restored. You got the Ethiopian Jews brought back. Did anybody Google the Capitol building in Strasbourg? It's not similar to the Tower of Babel, identical to the Tower of Babel. <laughs> and what's so cool, they have markings on the inside of the building are all from Nebuchadnezzar. The, the, the art out in front of the building is a molecule of iron magnified. So it's just, you've got, you got all these tangible things, so it's just uh, pr- pretty remarkable. We were talking at lunch today, Pastor Nate and Pastor Evan, we were talking about uh, 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 in, in Jerusalem. <laughs> you don't need a tour guide because the devil's so stupid, he puts a mosque everywhere Jesus did something cool. Uh, there's a mosque right there. What happened? That's where Jesus was raised from the dead. There's a mosque right there. What happened? That's where he was beaten. There's a mosque right there. That's where he, the, the ascension was. So the devil's so stupid, and there's a mosque right on the spot where Jesus is going to reign forever. You can go up in the temple mount in, in, uh, in, the, in the mosque in Arabic. It says in a circle, there is no son of God. There is no son of God. There is no son of God. Why? There is a son of God. <laughs> His name's Jesus. So basically, you don't even have to anybody tell you where something cool happened. You find a mosque, something cool must have happened here. Jesus did something very, very cool. So, so uh, it's crazy how in your face it is and how clear it is uh, that the Lord's about to come back. So watch what Jesus says before we go on further tonight. Look at verse 34. He said, take heed to yourselves, so that at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and the cares of this life, so that day comes upon you unawares. So he said, you could be around when those two things happen and not even be aware that the Lord's about to come back. I like the message translation. He said, don't let the sharp edge of your expectation get dulled by shopping. You can, I didn't say that. I'm quoting the message. But you can get so busy, busy with life that, that, that things that heaven talked about, what to be paying attention to could be to where you'd lose your sharp edge of your expectation. Why would the Lord talk about His coming? He wants you expectant. He wants you leaning in. He wants you praying more, studying more, hearing the word more. Just all in. Now, that, we would call that wholehearted. All throughout Scripture, God used people that were wholehearted. Job was wholehearted in all his ways. Abraham was wholehearted. Can you imagine? The Lord tells Abraham, you're going to have a bunch of kids. He's like, yeah, whatever. He goes, no, no, I'm the Almighty God. You are. Don't blow me off. The Lord's looking for people not to blow him off right now. He said, I've raised this group up to be a voice and a witness right before the coming of the Lord. So whether we're comfortable with it or not, you're a voice and you're a witness. In the Old Covenant, God would raise up the prophet's ministry to pull Israel back to do what they were called to do. In the New Testament, the believer's a voice. Wow. The Bible says that you could be so full of God that you could call people to you. In 1 Corinthians 12, it talks about that. They, they were called to idols that couldn't even speak. Yet God's speaking through you everywhere you go. Whether you realize it or not, there is an utterance for you to warn people that the Lord's coming back. It doesn't have to be weird or strange. We think of it as like John the Baptist, locust burgers, and you know, weird you know, honey and leather, you know, leather clothing. That's cool, but that's not what he's talking about. Jesus said John was a burning and a shining light. Woke up a dead nation. No one speaking from Malachi to Matthew. 400 years of silence. John comes on the scene and wakes up a whole dead nation. Yet he did no miracle. They said, are you a prophet? He said, no. They said, are you the prophet? He said, no, I'm a voice. The voice of one crying in the wilderness. Jesus said there hadn't been a greater prophet since him, ever was or ever will be. But the least in the kingdom of God's got more anointing than John the Baptist. You could have got in this last week, and you're more of a voice than John. So thank God for guys that have raised up the last hundred years to be a voice. He's raised the church up. So you can be ordering, you can be at Freddy's ordering a, a, a double with cheese, extra cheese, and double extra cheese, Diet Coke and fries, and you can say, oh, by the way, you know the Lord's about to come back. I'm, I'm, I'm getting to my next point. I remember I was in Sweden one time on my way to Sweden, and this lady goes, I don't know what's going on. I said, I know exactly what's going on. She's a flight attendant. She, she goes, I, I said, I know exactly what's going on. Israel returned to their land. Jerusalem was going back. Hebrew language resort. Ethiopian Jews brought back. Fertility the land of Israel. <gasps> Go get another flight attendant. Go get another flight attendant. Tell them what's going on. Israel, the land of the nation, Jerusalem. Went down the list. Go get another flight attendant. We had six or seven flight attendants having a church service on an airplane because people are looking for answers. You, man, could you imagine being in the world right now and not knowing the Lord? So God's going to use you. Impress that in your soul. He's going to use you. So we have all these signs of the second coming of the Lord. That's where Jesus physically, bodily comes back to the earth. We come back with him on white horses. How cool is that going to be? We're going to be raptured and go to the reward seat of Christ. Marriage supper of the Lamb. And then we're going to go to horse flying school. I don't know how that works. (laughs) But lean left trigger. I mean, you talk about the coolest thing that's ever going to happen to us. To all of a sudden be in heaven, and all of a sudden we're going to fly on horses back to the earth. And my friend, the, the heavens are going to, the, the, 
the universes and the galaxies are going to fold back and all of nature is going to have a, a, a make ready for the entrance of the king. And you talk about light. We haven't seen light like this. and It will be so radiant, it will be coming from the straight of that line. We're going to be coming right behind him. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that he's Lord to the glory of God the Father. So everything that's happening right now is a pressure to get the earth ready for this entrance. Okay, so we know we, we bodily come back with him, but we have to go there so that we can do that. And that's called the rapture of the church. So let's get into this. There's been a lot of weird preaching on the rapture lately that isn't scriptural. I watched it on TV. Great ministers, wonderful guys, but they would quote verses that don't have anything to do with the church. <laughs> they were all uh, Israeli verses for, for, for Jewish men that aren't saved. Look, I'll prove it to you. Look at, the, look at verse 36. Hang with me. You with me? How many glad you came tonight? How many glad you're here? You're not in surgery. Come on. Praise the Lord. All right. Look at verse 36. Watch the difference in the tone in verse 36. Watch you therefore and pray always that you might be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and stand before the Son of Man. I don't have to pray to be accounted worthy. He made me worthy. They had to pray to be accounted worthy because Jesus hadn't been raised from the dead yet. So people preach this. Oh, you're not going up in the rapture if you're not ready. He's not talking to the church there. He's talking to Jewish boys because he's having to fulfill the law flawlessly. So he did have to warn them. <laughs> if they hadn't accepted him as, his, their, as his, their king, they better do some radical works and get ready for it. So let's go ahead and look at this. It's so awesome. What an exciting event. Go over to 1 Thessalonians, and uh, we'll get there. Then I'll sing something off my greatest hits album. I know it's coming here close, so we'll have, we'll have a good time. I think that was real fear I felt right there. <laughs> Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, it's a, a tribulation, man, oh man. Go to 1 Thessalonians, let's look at this. So we know at the, at the rapture of the church, we go up to meet the Lord in the air. And at the second coming, Jesus physically and bodily comes back to the earth. Two separate events. Man, there's a lot of weird teaching on you know, the rapture pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib. We're going to get into something before we leave tonight. It shows you the rapture has to happen before the tribulation. So you don't have to be nervous or whatever. And I know that people have all different kind of views. Once you get into it, it'll flawlessly show you you can't be here. Okay? So let's go to 1 Thessalonians. since how that went over so good. But anyway, let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Run with me there for a little bit. And we'll, we'll, get, we'll get into all this stuff. It's so good. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. It's page 257. If you've got a Bible like mine, look at verse 13. He says here, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. So his teaching on the rapture was to make sure they had no sorrow and that they had radical hope. Really, he's talking here in 1 Thessalonians. This is the crazy thing. Nero had killed so many Christians, they thought they were in the tribulation. So he has to explain in 2 Thessalonians, Remember, I taught you these things while I was with you. Guess what Paul talked about for two weeks while he was with him? The rapture, the second coming, and the Antichrist. He explained that the, church, the Antichrist can't even come on the scene until the church is taken out of the way. You can't have the Christ and the Antichrist here at the same time. The Bible calls you Christ. You have so much authority, he can't even be revealed until there's a departure, a departure of the church. So Paul gets in more detail. Hang with me. Let's go there here in verse 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent or precede them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. How cool is that? And wherefore, because of that, comfort one another with these words. So he's, he's saying that the rapture is to comfort you and I, knowing that we're going to be caught up. I know it sounds bizarre and strange, but we're going to leave the planet. Just like Enoch walked with God, translated, raptured. Elijah, translated, raptured. Uh, Elisha, they came to Elisha, the sons of the prophets, said, don't you know your master's going to be taken from you today? He goes, yeah, I know, shut up. He knew the day Elijah was going to go up. Pretty wild. So uh, we've been taught wrong about the rapture because he goes on in Thessalonians and said, you're not in darkness so that day would overtake you as a thief. I can't tell you the exact day of the rapture, but I can tell you the season, and we'll get into that so that we're expectant and we're joyful. How many of you knew when your wedding was going to be? How many of you, your wedding caught you by surprise? <laughs> Boom, I'm married. No. <laughs> but that, that's weird. <laughs> no, there, there's preparation. There's planning. It doesn't just happen. There's all kinds of preparation. 
And God gave us a ton of verses so that we could see this. So he talks about this event. I've heard people go, well, the word rapture is not in the Bible. Yes, it is in the Latin. That's the word rapturo, where we're caught up. It's in the Bible. We're going to be snatched from the earth. I mean, how amazing that one moment, all of a sudden, we're going to get a glorified body. This mortal is going to put on immortal. Immortality. We, we've borne the image of the earthy. We're going to bear the image of the heavenly. The stain of Adam is going to be taken off of our flesh. Whoo, hallelujah. I don't know about you. I'm looking forward to a glorified body. Never to gain weight again. Yes. Come on. Never get tired again. It doesn't get cooler than that. Uh, th- th- certain things will just, we'll never even think like that. How fun is that going to be? Because see, my weight is perfect. I'm just not the right height. My weight's flawless if I was 6'3". But anyway, so I'm looking for, I'm really looking forward to that glorified body. So, so let's talk about the purpose of the rapture. We know we have an appointment. We, we're not supposed to be here during that seven years because it's the time of Jacob's trouble, Israel's trouble, not the church's trouble. And the purpose of the tribulation is pressure to get people to receive Jesus. So I've already received him. I don't need to be here and have pressure put on me. But the main purpose is for you to have your body changed. Remember in the old covenant, the cherubim, Isaiah looked up and saw the throne of God. He saw the cherubim had two wings that cover their face, two wings that they fly with, and two wings that cover their feet. Here, these, these, these uh, living creatures, or cherubim or cerebrum, they're created to be at the throne of God, but still can't look at the Father. He's so radiant, they have to shield themselves. So God's going to get us a new body, so that when, we, when we're raptured, we can go up and talk to Dad and not get fried. Wouldn't it be weird to go in and talk to your dad and have to wear goggles? Good to see you, Dad. What are those Ray-Bans for? I can't, I can't go in and talk to Dad without getting blind. No, no, no. We're going to have a body that we can handle that kind of radiance. It's so drastic that in the Bible, when man would see an angel, it was always shocking to see that realm because of the purity of that realm. So we're going to get us this body where we can walk right in. And obviously, we always go to Scripture. You can't just say that without giving you Bible. Remember when on the road to Emmaus when the, the disciples, a couple of them didn't know who Jesus was? I don't know how he did this, but the Lord kept them from knowing who he was. Remember that? They're walking on the way, and their eyes were beholding the fact that it was Jesus. And the first thing Jesus says to them, this is after he's raised from the dead, Why are you guys so sad? And they said, Well, hello, if you lived around here, they crucified our Lord. And the Bible says he would have kept right on walking, uh, but they constrained him to stay for dinner. As he sat down for dinner, he took them through the Word. He showed them Christ in the Old Covenant and brought it into the New. How cool is that? Jesus sitting there with you takes you through the Word. I would have gone, loser, it's me. But, you know, the Lord's so sweet, he didn't do that. He takes them through the Scripture and unveils Jesus to them through the Word. And all of a sudden, he breaks the little bread and he disappeared. He's translated. They said, did not our hearts burn within us the words that he spoke to us? His words are spirit and they are life. Wow. Well, they went back and told their buddies, hey, man, we saw him. He taught us the word and then he disappeared. Thomas goes, I don't believe that. (laughs) You know how your buddies are sometimes. No, I don't believe it. Don't believe it. Don't believe it. And I won't believe it until I put the hole in his side and I see the print in his hand. Jesus walks right through the wall. Thomas, reach hither your hand, thrust it into my side. Be not faithless, but believe me. Don't you love it? The Lord knows every word you say. Thomas said, my Lord and my God. That's exactly right. (laughs) So they kind of freaked out. He's a spirit. He just walked through the wall. How cool is that? With a glorified body, he walks through the wall. And the first thing he says is, do you have any meat? He didn't ask for kale. Didn't ask for salad. (laughs) Seriously. Think about that. Could you imagine if the Lord would have gone, do you have any broccoli? No. (laughs) Seriously. He said, do you have any meat? So all amazing, he can walk through the wall. They think he's a spirit, but he said, handle me. A spirit hath not flesh and bone, as you see I have. And yet he had an appetite for meat. So the rapture is not an ending, it's a beginning. I hear all these people go, I don't want the rapture to happen. i got so much in my heart. You're going to live forever. We'll get into it tomorrow night. You're you're functioning in this stuff. You're tasting of the powers of the world to come. The gifts of the Spirit are tasting of that. How much more the fulfillment of that? You've got a thousand years to reign on the earth with Jesus, your King. How cool is that going to be? So here, that's our glorified body. We're going to get us a brand new body. 
All right, what's the qualification? Go back to verse 14. You always go to the Word. The Word will give you the answer for everything. Look at verse 14. If we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with Him. So the prerequisite to go up in the rapture is to be in the body of Christ. I've heard people preach, well, if you don't have faith for it, you're not going to go up. Well, actually, He's coming back for a certain species that we really don't have control over it. The rapture is not about us. It's about Him. We've tried to make it about us. Am I holy enough? Am I cool enough? No, no, it's not about that. His blood purchased you. So at the rapture of the church, he's going to get reunited with his body. Just like if I was walking around tonight with one leg, I'd be looking forward to having my new leg. He's looking forward to being reunited with his body, and that's what the rapture is. I told you before, I had a lady in Galveston walk up to me, and she goes, well, how dare you say if you're in the body of Christ, you're going up? I said, well, you know, (laughs) I'm not that bright, but I got verses that show me that. And the Holy Spirit loves to magnify Jesus. He said, ask her, whose works would she rather trust in? Her own works or Jesus' works? I pretty much will throw my works aside and take Jesus' works. By himself he purged our sins. Sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Being made so much better than the angels. Has he by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they? Oh, come on. God who at sundry times and divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son whom he made heir of all things by whom also he made the worlds being the brightness of the glory of God and the express image of his person. Withhold, come on, this is our king you're talking about. The first thing we're going to see when we get to heaven, we're going to see the throne, we're going to be freaked out, we're going to see the rainbow, we're going to be freaked out and then there's going to be a basin right in front of the throne. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins when sinners dip beneath that blood lose all their guilty saying come on God's own blood was poured out for you that's why he purchased you that's why when he says come up hither come up to the throne of God you're going to be evacuated off the earth in a brand new body and you talk about a party you haven't seen a party till you see the marriage supper of the Lamb. we're going to have a wonderful time so this is coming the crazy thing for us is to talk about how soon it is because it's very soon. That still freaks me out that we're that generation, but we're, we're privileged. So he told us, here, comfort one another. The word comfort there is the word exhort. It means to call nearer to God. When you were talking about that verse tonight, when you got up there, that's to exhort us. It's to call us nearer to God. He wants you white, hot, fervent in spirit. He's got some surprises for us. You know, when Colleen and I got married, we got married in Tulsa, and I was living in an old house down by Utica Square, and the girls got, the, her and all her bridesmaids got all ready for the wedding there. They were getting all their makeup on and all that. I had my best man take my wife a gift while they were getting ready, and I had one of my buddies that's a piano player for Brother Copeland play songs out in the backyard, Colleen's favorite songs. I wanted to have her blessed on that day we're getting ready to get married. God's got some things for us right here before we're raptured. I'm talking about radical surprises. If I think like that, think of how the Lord thinks about you. Amen. All right, let's go go a little further here. Okay, the rapture of the church. The rapture is only mentioned in the epistles. There's a little bit of a hidden reference in the gospels, but you can't get your rapture doctrine from the gospels because he's only talking about kingdom stuff. Remember in Matthew 24, one's taken and one's left? That's not the rapture. That's the second coming. Okay, so let's go a little further. Let's go. Let's go talk about uh, the only little hidden reference to the raptures in John. Now, this is pretty cool because Jesus basically kind of freaks the guys out. Remember, he says, In my Father's house there are many mansions that were not so would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you that where I am there you may be also. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself. Remember that in John 14? He basically said to them, Will you marry me? Now, remember, guys don't ask guys to marry them. I'm in the right room. I think I lost somebody. Everybody, come back. Come back. <laughs> where, where is everybody? Come on back. So, so Jesus basically proposed to them, and it kind of freaked them out. So in the uh, Jewish wedding tradition, a man would ask a woman to marry him. They would be betrothed. He would go back to his father's house. His father would oversee the building of a honeymoon suite, and the father would tell the son when the room is done. So I interviewed all these ladies in Israel. I go, tell me, how, how, how much did you know of information, how quickly it was going to be when the, when the son's going to come get you or when your husband's going to come get you? Because you'd be betrothed. The father would say, the room's ready. And he said, go get your bride. And with a shout, he would run back for her. So she would remain in a constant state of readiness. I said, how would you know when? She said, word would come to us when the room is almost done. Words come to us that the house is almost complete. The fullness of the Gentiles is pretty much in. Come on. So words come to us. And this is what one lady said to me. She goes, we wouldn't want to spend all this money on perfume in six more months. 
they said we'd know almost to the day. And we'll get into that. There's about a three-day period called the Feast of Trumpets that we'll know that's when the rapture is going to be. I can't tell you the year, but I can tell you pretty much it's going to be in the fall of whatever year it is. And when Jesus said, hang with me for a minute because this is way too much information, but hang with me. Everybody with me? When Jesus said of that day and that hour, no man knows, he was telling them, I'm coming back for you on Feast of Trumpets. Because the Feast of Trumpets was on a new moon. It was on the 29.5th day of the month. So the Sanhedrin would send two witnesses out. Is it the new moon yet? They couldn't tell it until it was like that. So they didn't know which day it was going to be. The 29th, the 30th. Because there was kind of a wiggle room right there. And that's called the Feast of Trumpets. It also means the beginning of a coronation of a king. You have a private ceremony and a public ceremony. The private ceremony is for us. He's going to be presented to us as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We'll come back at the second coming. He'll be presented to the earth as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. It's also the beginning of seven days of awe, mirroring the seven years of tribulation. Okay? But the Feast of Trumpets happens before that. So we talked about it this morning. The Lord's so amazingly flawless. Hang, hang with me for a minute. Everybody with me for just a little bit longer? Jesus fulfilled these feasts, or what we call festivals. They were dress rehearsals. Why did the Lord do dress rehearsals? So when the real came, it was easy to understand. So remember Passover? Jesus went to the cross on what feast? Passover. Remember, he's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Pretty amazing. <laughs> All right, what was the next feast? The next feast was unleavened bread. <laughs> Jesus is on the cross, and normally you're on the cross for a long time, like a, uh, like a week to show people don't break the law. Jesus had a feast to keep. So he's buried on unleavened bread. Okay, what was unleavened bread? They took three pieces of bread. The middle piece, they, they pierced it, they folded it, and they broke it. He said, I am the bread of life. Born in Bethlehem means home of the bread. So he goes to the cross on Passover, buried on unleavened bread. What happened on the next festival? First fruits. He's the first one born from the dead. Flawless. All right, what was the next feast? Fifty days later, Pentecost happened. The Holy Spirit was poured out on Pentecost. What's the next feast to be fulfilled? Feast of trumpets, feast of gathering. So all of a sudden, we're going to hear this trumpet sound. And, and, and in an amount of time that cannot be divided, it's the smallest measure of time, an atomic second, we're going to all of a sudden be glorified. The blood that's in your body is going to be changed to the glory of God. You're going to have flesh and bone, and we're going to rock it up to heaven. You talk about shouting. You talk about worship. We're going to be worshiping at a decibel. It's going to freak people out. They're going to go, we never, and I'm, I'm going to be, so, it's going to be the coolest thing on the planet that all of a sudden we're there. Hallelujah. So that's the rapture of the church. So soon for us to be caught up and to be gathered together with him in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. There's a lot of things here that the, he's so powerful, he's able to subdue even all things unto himself. Think how powerful it is that one word, our bodies are altered. Let every born-again believer, boom, disappears from the planet. <laughs> I used to think people would freak out. I don't think they're going to freak out now. I think they're going to rejoice. <laughs> After watching what's been going on the last six months, they're going to go, oh, glory. They're going to go, glory to God. We finally got rid of those people. <laughs> no, there's a lot, a lot of work to be done in a short period of time, and that's why God raises you up, to have an accelerated mentality of the coming of the Lord. So let's go look at something that shows us we can't be here during the trib. Go to Daniel. If you've got your Bibles there, buzz over to Daniel for a minute. Daniel chapter 9. And I know this is a real complicated thing, but it's really not that complicated. It's probably the most precise verses in the Bible. I mean, it's amazing what the Lord showed Daniel about the nations right before the coming of the Lord. But he's going to sh Gabriel's going to show Daniel some stuff here. Gabriel's going to give Daniel the exact year of the first coming of the Lord. Pretty, pretty wild. So look over here. Got, got your Bibles there? Run to Daniel. Remember, if, uh, it's good to write in your Bible. Remember, dirty Bible, clean Christian. Come on. <laughs> clean Bible, dirty Christian. Here we go. Come on. No. Look at your neighbor. Come on. <laughs> All right, look at Daniel 9. Run with me there to Daniel 9. Because this, this is going to sound boring, but it's going to get cool. So hang with me, okay? Daniel 9, verse 1. In the first year of Darius, which was the son of whatever that was, and was the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem. Well, Daniel's like, let's find out why we're in captivity. So he goes, I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplication 
with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. So Daniel's trying to find out why they're in captivity. He goes back to the books and finds out this is really amazing. They were supposed to let the land rest every seven years. That you're going to be so blessed going at the end of the sixth, it'll carry you over in the seventh. Don't, don't plant. Let the land rest. Take a whole year of not planting on the seventh year. Well, guess how long they fudged. They kind of fudged one year, fudged the next year, fudged the next year. They, they fudged for 490 years. So they owed the land back 70 years. So God didn't put them in captivity. He allowed them to go into captivity because they didn't do what they were supposed to do. Man, I'm glad we live in the New Testament. Amen? Come on. Can I get a good amen out of that? So they owed the land 70 years because God, how long did they disobey? 490 years. All right, now go to verse 23, and let's watch how cool this is. These are some of the most precise verses in the Bible. Look at verse 23. At the beginning, this is Gabriel talking to Daniel. At the beginning of thy supplication, the commandment came forth. I am come to show you are greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. He goes, okay, you guys missed it for 490 years. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon the holy city of Jerusalem. He goes, you missed it for 490? God's given you another 490. Who's it for? The Jews and for the city, Jerusalem. Okay? Seventy segments of seven is another way of saying 490 years. Now watch what the Lord says here. Keep going. So you missed it for 490? God's so cool, he's giving you another 490. It says to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, bring an everlasting righteousness, seal of the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Look at verse 25. Here we go. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince will be a certain amount of weeks. And I'm going to add them up for you so you don't have to add them up. He basically said, you're going to hear a commandment to rebuild Jerusalem. The clock's going to start when you hear that. So King Artaxerxes was talking to Nehemiah. Nehemiah was all bummed out. And uh, he said, well, what's wrong? Jerusalem's overthrown. He said, don't worry. I'm going to make a proclamation just like Gabriel said. So right then, King Artaxerxes goes, we shall rebuild Jerusalem. Clock started. Okay? Remember when Jesus came on the scene? They said, are you the Messiah? He said, go tell them what you see and what you hear. John the Baptist goes, it's not looking good for me. They're going to cut my head off. Go ask him, is he really the one that's coming? Because this is not faring out real well for me. What what Jesus tell him? Go tell him what you see and what you hear. But there came a day when Jesus came riding into Jerusalem on that donkey. They took the palm branches and laid them down. Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. I said, oh man, don't, don't let them say that. You're admitting you're the Messiah. He said, if they didn't do it, the rocks would cry out. So if you add the years up <laughs> from the going forth of the commandment to, till Jesus was going to come, he told them 483 years. Well, God promised them 490. So God owes them seven years of old covenant time. That's called the tribulation period. He promised them 490. He came after 483. So there's seven years of time that God owes them back. He takes the church off the earth and repays Israel those seven years. Everything you've seen happening to Israel the last hundred years is preparation for that seven-year period. I mean, the Holocaust, six million Jews were killed. It's amazing. Germany prospered after killing six million Jews. Think about that. See, God's not mad at anybody right now. People don't like to say that, but he's not. Germany prospered after killing six million Jews. It was the church's fault that we didn't pray because God gave the church all authority. That's why the church has to be raptured. You have so much authority, he's got to take you off the earth so he can do what he wants to do during that seven-year period. We'd be talking to asteroids. I was preaching in the Ukraine. I, I was talking about the, the asteroid that's going to hit called Wormwood. It's going to make a third of the waters radioactive. Everybody gasped when I said Wormwood. I said, what's, what, what's Wormwood mean? It's the word Chernobyl. So, <laughs> so there's a lot of changes coming to the earth. We happen to be this group of people that are living right up to the edge of these changes. I got a friend that got 2 million people born again in the Sudan. There was a, a demon-possessed man that had hair all the way down to the floor. They had him in chains. And, and the guy goes, don't unhook him. He'll start biting everybody. I said, no, he won't. I'm going to cast the devil out of him. And he's going to be freed right here in front of everybody. The guy cast the devil out of him. They took the chains off of him, cut his hair, put clothes on him. And the leader, the Islamic Muslim leader of the nation said, we're going to follow 
Christianity. They had two million people saved in two weeks. We, we bought backpacks with, with uh, solar panels on them, hundreds of them, from this guy in California. They took the backpacks to the Sudan, and they put a sheet up, and they played a projector out of the backpack, didn't need electricity, taught new members classes in all of their languages. You're living right before all this happens. The very harvest of the earth. And all of a sudden the church is going to hand off to Israel. We're going to depart. God's going to raise up 144,000 Jewish evangelists. 12,000 from each tribe. And you're watching all these Jewish men right now become best friends with Pentecostals. Because we're about to hand off to them. Remember Elisha said, where is the Lord God of Elijah? I believe those Jewish men will say, where is the Lord God of the last day church? Let's, let's show them some stuff. I've done videos for a couple of them. I believe they're going to lead up to 144,000. I said, this is what you do when we disappear. You put your hand on your head. You accept Jesus as your Messiah. And then you baptize yourself in the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Gets quiet when you say that. But, but the spirit of supplication is going to come upon them. And all of a sudden, they're going to rise up and go out and harvest the earth. The Bible tells you how much their harvest is. It's half of the population. One's taken and one's left. Half. Half of the earth will get born again while all that hell's happening. So we've got to do something to show them what, what, what our God is like. Yes. Think about the responsibility. Good night, everybody. Drive safely. Come on, start the car. I'll be right there. No, no. We have, we have this season right before we're caught up to where you have, you have the healing revival. You, Raymond T. Ritchie had so many wheelchairs... People in wheelchairs healed in Tulsa. They had to haul away the wheelchairs and flatbed trucks. I mean, that was, that was a man that no one even knew who he was. So we, we're a part of this restructuring of the church into a voice. Wow. It's without fanfare. It's not weird. It's not strange. It's normal. Jesus is about to come back. So I don't want to freak you out, but I mean, all the signs we talked about this morning and a little bit tonight, those are all for the second coming. So you've got to back up seven or eight years for the rapture. So I don't think we have a lot of time left. I mean, people get mad when I say that. They go, why do you say we don't have a lot of time left? I mean, we'd still have some time left. I said, because I think we still have some time left. <laughs> Amen. So, but you got Jesus appearing to children in Iran. Jesus appearing to children in Malaysia. you got Jesus doing stuff that years ago. I was in Israel. A Palestinian guide was helping us. Jesus had appeared to him. And he gets born again. Mad at Israel. And, and God stands there and talks to him. I'm stopping right now, but I remember years ago, the Lord told me, uh, gosh, 1987, he appeared to me. I was praying in my middle bedroom because my wife, we were pregnant with our daughter, and uh, pregnant ladies go to bed early, so I just prayed a lot while I was in this season. I mean, it's 6 o'clock, boom, she's out, so I'm praying in tongues. And uh, I was in the middle bedroom of our house there in Tulsa, and man, I felt this presence come in. I just began to cry, I look up, and there's Jesus. He told me to preach on end times. This is 1987. Because I'd been preaching some, and my message was about the power of God and miracles. And he goes, he said, talk about the coming of the Lord. I said, I don't want to do that. And he said, that's what you're supposed to do. This is what he said. It doesn't matter what you want to do. This is what you're supposed to do. So, you know, you think of all the cool things you say to Jesus in a situation like that, which is like a Diet Coke. Uh, <laughs> Abraham killed a cow and made steak for him. So I'm just so freaked out. I'm bawling so bad I can't even say anything. So Jesus disappears. And I didn't really preach on end times. <laughs> About three years later, I was in Michigan, uh, Hastings, Michigan, traveling around the whole state, and this is in 1990. And I was staying with some friends of mine. I traveled out of their house. My buddy has this really cool office. He has these walnut walls, and I'd go in there and listen to music and get ready to preach. I'd pray in tongues, listen to Sandy Patty uh, tapes because they were songs about Jesus. I don't like begging songs. I don't like whining songs. I like songs about Jesus. And uh, so I was desperate to hear songs about Jesus, so I'm listening to Sandy Patty. And man, the presence of God came in that office, and I thought, man, I thought, the Lord's just so good. First thing I thought of is how good he is. I'm thinking, I don't deserve how good you are. Look up, and there's Jesus right there, right in front of me. White robe, olive green sash. Had his hands behind his back like that, leaned up against my buddy's desk. And uh, he just looked at me. And I thought, man, I knew, Newman, I knew exactly what was going on. I hadn't preached what he told me to preach. He didn't say I was a loser. You know, you know what he did? His love reached out to me. And his goodness caused me to change. I went to the next church. I ran over the pews. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. <laughs> Jesus is coming. I don't want to say the Lord's desperate, but he's really doing everything he can to get the message out. Why? He loves you. He wants you expectant. This should be the most 
radically exciting times of our lives because we're about to be caught up. I don't know what the preparation is for that. I don't how excited you were two or three days before your wedding. Maybe you were busy. Maybe you didn't have a chance to be excited. But the excitement leading up to the wedding should get only more radical. I couldn't imagine you at the wedding going, here we go. <laughs> no, there, there, there's a joy. There's a, it's, a, it's a celebration. My friend, in the church, there should be great celebration going on in our spirits. Because even though we haven't seen him, we're about to see him in person right there at the throne of God. Wow. So let's pray. Lord, we love you. We thank you for these truths about your return. Boy, Lord, we're looking forward to new bodies. Can't wait for that. But even before we get that, we, we're quickened now. Thank you for your spirit that quickens this mortal body right now. Lord, we thank you for your kindness, your goodness. We magnify your goodness before we leave tonight. We thank you for your kindness too, Lord. We're in awe that you're so good to us. Help us honor you. Help us bless you. Help us lift you up as we are. We thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, for sending Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, you know, I had a couple of words of knowledge come to me, and I, I, I preach on end times so much, I don't really have a lot of time to flow, but I had a couple of them. One of them was whiplash. Uh, maybe you're here, and uh, you can just wave at me. Maybe you're here. You, I don't even know if you're in a car wreck. It could have been something else. Whiplash. I know that's real common, but the Lord's real particular about her. Uh, I, I was, wasn't even thinking about words of knowledge when I came in. He started talking to me. I was like, okay, yeah, whatever. We'll get it. Okay, amen. One lady right there. Anybody else have the whiplash? We'll do this a little different because of time. But uh, were you in a car wreck or something else? Okay, devil's a liar, pants on fire. Amen, come on. Amen. You made it through the car wreck and you're here. Now I'm going to speak to your neck and your neck's going to be made whole. Father, we thank you for, for our sister. Thank you for her making it through that wreck. Thank you for her being in church on Sunday night. And we speak to the damage in her disc and her vertebrae. And we command it to be whole. In the name that's above every name. The wonderful name of Jesus. We take it, Lord. Thank you for that. We take it. In Jesus' name. Amen. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. And this other thing, uh, you know, I would think of it being a child, but there's someone here, you got damage in the inner part of your ear. I think it's your, that tube that goes from your ear to your nose. Uh, that, I, really, it's, a, it's a, not a child. It's an adult. Who's got that damage in your tube in your ear? Let's get you fixed up. What, what, ha- what happened to your tube? For years? Devil's a liar, pants on fire. Amen. Come on. Father, we thank you for blessing our sister. Thank you for restoring this, the, this tube, Lord. Of to perfection. You're so good. Your back was torn open, Jesus. That's so kind of you to let yourself be beaten like that. So we receive tonight wholeness for her station tube. We thank you for restoration for her. In Jesus' wonderful name. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that, Lord. That's so kind of you. Amen. 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 Praise God. I was in a service in California. I had a word of knowledge that someone got uh, they're, they're, they have varicose veins. And I said, Lord goes, it's not varicose veins. It looks like varicose veins, but it's like you got hit by a two before. And this man yelled out, damn, cussed out loud. <laughs> yeah, uh, Marietta Cal- cussed out loud. He goes, that's me. <laughs> he, he, goes, he goes, I got hit by a two before. I'm going in for surgery. It's not varicose veins, but it looks like varicose veins. Prayed for him and... Uh, there were some PGA golfers there, never been in a Holy Ghost service ever. And you know, it, it, the, the Lord's so sweet, does the word of knowledge, heal that guy. And that guy going back to his seat was almost cussing on the way back to his seat. He goes, goes, man, man. I said, dude, are you cussing after you get healed before, and before you get healed? He was so shocked. I could tell you story after story after story where people cussed when I got healed. Washington, D.C., I pray for this guy. And he goes, he goes shoot. He didn't say shoot. <laughs> The Lord's just so kind and so good. Let's thank him for a second before we dismiss. Lord, we thank you. Thank you for healing that lady's tube. Thank you for healing uh, that lady, uh, uh, her, her neck. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We bless you and honor you. We bless you, Jesus, and we honor you. We bless you and honor you. Hallelujah. Thank you for your kindness, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. You know, someone here, this is uh, different, but your taste buds. You got damage in your taste buds. You watch. Mark it down in your book, 744. On, uh, on Sunday night, your taste buds return. He loves you so much, he wants you to enjoy your food. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for restoring their taste buds. Praise God. Praise God. Amen, amen. Thank you, Lord. You know, this just sounds weird, but I'll call it out anyway. Uh, 
ir- irritable bowel syndrome. Uh, your digestive tracts got damaged. Amen. You're healed. Now, this, I'll show you how weird this is, and I'm going to let you go. I'm in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The Lord said hemorrhoids. I said, Lord, I'm not calling that out. Because <laughs> there's not a cool way to call that out. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? There's no way you can kind of say it without it being hemorrhoids. This lady's name, I'll tell you her name because I don't think you'll go to Pittsburgh next week. Her name is Carol Nemitis. She was part of this woman, the elderly woman started this church in Pittsburgh. And the Lord said, Joe's going to call, she had hemorrhoids. And the, Lord, the Lord said, Joe's going to call out hemorrhoids. You can either go down and get heal, healed or go have your surgery. She'd been drinking chalk for three days. She was kind of mad that she drank all that chalk, didn't even have to. <laughs> I preach in churches all around Pittsburgh, and Carol will be the lady that's kind of my go-between to go to those other churches. And she'll say, hey, don't mention me by name when you tell that story. I said, I won't. I don't hardly ever tell that story because it's so weird. But I could tell you story after story of gifts of the Spirit that you just go, that did not happen. One time I had a word of knowledge that a man bruises male parts. I was in Glenwood Springs, Colorado. I said, Lord, I'm not calling that out. <laughs> And it's like, the Lord's not freaked out about that stuff. I said, okay, there's somebody. The Lord goes, you're chicken. All right, I said, all right, there's a man here. You bruised his mail, your male parts. And nobody came down. Not a, nobody moved. Everybody... <laughs> so I waited for a few minutes. And I said, no, I'm not leaving until you come. The pastor stood up. And he'd had some surgery to not have any more children. Now watch. I said, no, that's not it. How embarrassing is that to stand up and tell the whole church... I said, no, that's not it. So I waited for a little bit. I said, I'm not leaving until you come. Now, see, I haven't done that here because I just don't, didn't have time. But I, I said, I'm not leaving until you come. I sat down on the platform. I said, I'm not leaving until you come. All of a sudden, I saw this guy on a horse. This horse come through this thicket. There was a little creek right there. And the horse stopped. Instead of jumping the creek, it stopped like that. And the man flew off the horse and caught himself on the horn of the saddle. The guy's name was Rusty. He come walking down. I've been back to that church 20 times. I said, I'll go, hey, Rusty, how's it going back there, buddy? He goes, quit talking about me, man. Leave me alone. <laughs> But look how cool the Lord is. He just, he just wants to bless you. Gosh, let's bless him one more time, then we'll go. Lord, we are so amazed at your love and your kindness. Your love and your mercy is amazing. We, we're amazed at your kindness. Lord, help us honor you. Holy Spirit, help us honor the Son. Jesus, have the preeminence in our lives that you should have. We glorify you, magnify you. King of kings, Lord of lords. We bless you tonight. Lord, we're, we're so excited to see you face to face. Help us fulfill your will before we meet you face to face. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, we'll, we'll come back uh, tomorrow night and we'll, we'll get into more and we'll have a good time. We'll be blessed. We'll be encouraged. Have a great night. Say no to drugs and come back tomorrow if you can. <laughs> Pastor Nate, are you, are you, who, who do I turn it to? Give, give Pastor Nate a big hand as he comes. Come on. Bless you, Pastor Nate. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, hey, um, just so you know, we're not doing any time deal, you know. Um, we say that all the time. But uh, I'm going to just say that right now because if, there, if you have anything, you know, so we can just wait on the Lord for a little bit. Um, <clears throat> I, I actually want to do that because I was just going to dismiss. And I got up here and then it was like, no, we're just going to wait a second. Um, because... <clears throat> Close our eyes. Lift our hands. Thank you, Father. It's time. It's time. just hear that in my heart so strong I just heard you talk about the time but I'm just telling you it's time the 
the season of assignment. It's time. Even the things you've seen in your heart, the hands that are lifted toward me. They're to go towards others. It's time. It's time. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. I just want to take a moment and pray in the pray in the spirit. Um, if you're filled with the spirit um, and speak to just let's pray that pray out mysteries. <clears throat> I'm gonna tell a story just like Joe tells a story. Sometimes we dismiss really early. And we dismiss prematurely, and I don't mean that as in from who was speaking. I just mean as in sometimes um, somebody came, and they needed they needed somebody just to press in a little bit more. And um, this happened for me um, this this last year in June. Um, interesting. I got a message for this man this morning, and I didn't even read it, along with. Let's see. Let's check these 57 dots here. Wow. He texts me. His name's Tom Cromwell. He's a pastor of a, a church up in Missouri. And um, we went to a Rama conference, which was for, it was for ministers, just a real small thing for our area. And um, anyway, uh, the first night we were there, he said, uh, we dismissed. It was so good just like tonight. And he got up and he, he said, uh, and it had been a long night, okay? So a lot of times, Rhema nights can be really long. And um, long for pastors, and if it's long for pastors, you would not like it. I mean, I don't mean you wouldn't like it, but I'm just saying it's long. And he says, uh, I, just, I just feel like there's something else. And it was like, okay, I was like hoping we were going to go eat because it's 10, almost 10 o'clock and there's nothing going to be open and we're in Branson. You know, I mean, I'm just talking real. And he said, let's just pray for a minute. And so he said, let's just pray in, the, let's pray in the spirit. And he made a demand. He made a demand on heaven. And he waited a moment. It changed um, even, it changed so many things in, our, in, in, in my life. Um, I can tell you the word that came out was a lady gave a word. A little, little, little lady. Little sweet lady gave a word and she began to speak in tongues. And it was like sweet. And then she began to uh, interpret the tongues and she began to speak in, with such an authoritative voice and when she was began to speak, or when she began to speak, she just began to be, speak real simply, like in that same sweet voice. And then, then I and I knew it was for me. The whole message actually was for me uh, that he ministered that night. And I reasoned away everything, uh, like like five different things. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was about a course change. It was about. It was actually about getting back in construction because it was an easy way to make a lot of money. And. Um, for me, anyway, building. And uh, we had acquired some land and had all this, these plans. And it was being like, oh, it's going to, and I had this idea of where I put together in a few years I'm going to be meant, you know, because um, I wanted something. Um, and the Lord said, I never asked you to do that. And I need you to quit or you're going to be taken off. And I could tell there was um, a drawing back on some of the things for this church. But I kept reasoning away. I said, Lord, I can do that too. I can, I can do it together. We can do it together. I mean, we're kind of in a small town. We're kind of big for a small town. I mean, you kind of get, I don't know if this makes sense, but you kind of can say, okay, what now? What now? 
And she began to speak. In that sweet voice. And then she began to say this. Did I not tell you? And she spoke with such authority. Did I not tell you? Did I not tell you? Lay that down. Pick that up. Lay that down. I mean, it was like so, I, you couldn't argue with it. But here's what I'm telling you. That was a, that's a word for somebody tonight. You're to lay that down and you're to pick that other thing back up. And I'm going to read this, and this is Tom Cromwell. He sent me this morning, um, Isaiah chapter 10, verse 27. And it shall come to pass that in the day that his burden will be taken away from his shoulders and his yoke from his neck, and the yoke will be destroyed because of the anointing oil. We are carriers of the yoke-destroying anointing. We always have to step over our flesh to <laughs> obey God. And he said, yoke's destroyed today. It was an encouraging word Think for for ministry and that's exactly right for even us before we go and just that that word do with our hands lifted to heaven we said it's it's time it is time it's time it's time to what step over your flesh it's time like even on Wednesday night listen people are calling people are crying out and they just to say would you get it's not like what look at the time no it's time it's time to step over ourselves. It's time to understand that we carry the anointing, the very Spirit of God on the inside of us, the, the burden-removing, yoke-destroying, anointing, the very presence of God. When you see something, this is so natural. Yeah, just see, just, you, you get a word, a word, a word of wisdom, a word of knowledge, and, 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 and you, you move on it. And just like you said, are you chicken? We got to learn. We got to learn just how to how to be just a responder naturally. It's very naturally. We're just a natural responder. And so before we go, I don't have any like word of knowledge or, or anything. I mean, I felt like that was exactly right. It is time. And some of you that spoke exactly to you because you've seen certain things in your heart and, and you've seen uh, pictures in your heart. You saw yourself even leading people. You've seen yourself being a leader. Let me tell you, it starts right where you're at. It starts right at your workplace. It starts right now, right now at your workplace. That you are what God has showed you. Now start operating. Start walking in that. Be the leader on your crew. Take the lead. Take the charge. That's what that He put you there. It's time. But also, the, anyway. So we're gonna pray the, the, tonight uh, before we go and just um and just I, I just believe with all my heart as we're going tomorrow to work and commission. Um, when I say commission, that means on assignment from the Lord. Man, God has, on you, has, has you on assignment tomorrow. Yeah, I know you're not going to school, a lot of you, because it's, you know, school in Alma is not, I don't know about Van Buren, but guess what? God has you on assignment every single day. And I love what Pastor Joe says, or Brother Joe, he's, you know, he says, you don't have to be weird. God's not weird. I'm not talking about my dad that way. People are weird. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, we have to be willing to step over ourselves, get over ourselves, and move based upon the inward, the inward witness, the inward voice of the Holy Spirit just saying, hey. And it's normal. It's normal for the church to walk with the Spirit. It's, nor it's normal for the church to see the burden-removing, yoke-destroying Spirit of God, presence of God, go with you wherever you go, and see the very thing that Jesus said. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointing me to preach the gospel. So good news. You got some good news? Somebody who have a lot of bad news? Let me tell you, you're anointed just to bring the good news. What God says over the situation, it'll change what you, what you see. That's what he just released tonight. Good news. Good news about eardrums. Good news about eyes this morning. Good news. What God said, the, the, the deaf, the, you know, the eyes open, blind see, recovery of sight, you know, to the blind, the broken heart right? Restored, captive, set free. I'm telling you guys, it's time. It is time. It's time. Let's just lift our hands to the Lord before we go. Father, we love you so much. Thank you for bringing us here tonight. Thank you for just the alarm clock going off in our spirit. Just that we, 
we know the season in which we live. And we just say thank you. Lord, thank you for the gift tonight. Thank you for speaking, being the teacher. And Lord, thank you for using us and choosing us for such a time as this. I just ask you tonight that you would expand our vision. Expand the vision of, uh, uh, of this vessel, of these vessels. Expand, expand. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, tomorrow night we're going to be here at 6.30. 7, excuse me. Tonight was 6.30. Tomorrow night we'll be here at 7. And um, maybe continue on some end times. Maybe just what does it look like, the church to look like. Um, you know, the gift of spirit. I don't know what we're going to be ministering on. We just knew we, need, we were supposed to have them for four days. And so that's tomorrow night and uh, Tuesday night, 7. And we won't be having church on Wednesday. So we're going we're gonna to roll through this week, Monday and Tuesday. And I know you'll be blessed. Bring a friend. Bring a friend. You know, the greatest thing we could ever do, ever, is bring a friend to Jesus. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great evening.